thank you so much. I'm so excited that there is, are more people in Omaha excited about UX than just me. <laughs> this is very exciting. Um, so how many of you are familiar with at least the, the acronym of UX? So you've heard it. Okay, what about user experience? You've heard the term. Okay, maybe they got some most, mostly nods, right? How many of you would say that you confidently know what UX is? Far fewer hands. That's okay, that's okay. Um, I didn't know what UX was um, when I started um, just going out into the working world. So this is, this is me and one of my two Labradoodles, this is Penny. Um, she has supported me the most in my career, um, sitting by me as I work on my computer and Lola's off doing something else. So I have two Labradoodles, Penny and Lola. They're the light of my life. And my husband is wonderful as well, I love him. Um, but you will hear me wax poetic about my dogs more often than not. But um, I am super excited to talk about UX. I am super excited to tell you that you don't have to know um, all that it, and it, all that it entails in order for you to appreciate it and understand the true value of it. Um, so I am still learning about a ton of different techniques that we can use in order to understand the users that we're um, building, at least in, in my particular um, situation, the digital products that we're building for the, the people that we service. Um, but um, yeah, again, I'm just really excited that you're like, yeah, now I'll spend my Tuesday with her. <laughs> Um, so I started my career in human resource development, um, just kind of a smattering of, of different HR type jobs. Um, I worked in a, a leadership development type role. Um, I worked implementing um, HR info systems, which should have been the light bulb that was like, this is great. No, I really like this. Um, and then I was like, well, I went through my graduate program. Um, in uh, for a master's and I thought I don't know what I really want to be what I grow up yet so I'm gonna go to more school that feels like what people do right they just like learn until they can't learn anymore until your brain fills up like a, a an over wet sponge um, so I went to um, a PhD program at the University of Buffalo um, that was focused on organizational behavior opened my eyes to the concept of social network analysis and just how interconnected we are and how to actually track um, how people know each other um, and in what capacity that knowledge of one another can actually affect uh, what we do day to day. Um, they were training me in order to be um, an academic and I was like, I like school, but do I like school that much? Um, and so that's what landed me in Omaha. So I'm originally from the East Coast. I grew up in New York State. Um, and I came to Omaha to pursue a PhD in industrial and organizational psychology, which is long and short of it, um, is the psychology of work. So I focused on creativity, teamwork, leadership, um, and I had the incredible opportunity to work in um, what was mostly an undergraduate lab until I showed up. Um, it was a bunch of guys playing with different frameworks, um, get, get, getting to build different things with this one um, professor advisor. And I, what I was doing um, in that role was looking at technology through a psychology lens. And I thought, is there a way that I can do this every day? Like it doesn't have to be in the lab. And I realized that what I was really being trained to do was user research, was to understand um, who are the people that we're actually building stuff for. So I had the unique opportunity to work on a project for Stratcom in understanding um, how do we build a new emergency communication system for the folks within the government who really need it? So the, the red phone that you see in the movies, real thing. Um, so what we did was just create a prototype of what it could look like if we wanted to improve the communication in times of crisis and in emergency. And so I did all of this research in trying to understand how do other people solve this problem? What are other people currently doing? And again, what I was being trained to do was user research to understand who are the people who are going to use this, what's important to them, and how do I build this in a way that makes sense to them? Because if you're in a situation of communication and crisis, um, you don't want to be like, hey, Larry, can you get the manual? I have to use the phone. Can you, can you get that? 
You don't want to have to do that. You don't have time or the, the cognitive energy in order to figure out how do I set this up and then also deliver this very important message. So that's kind of what sparked me to say, do people do this in real life? Turns out they do, and that's what I do now. Um, but for um, the farmers and ranchers that Farm Credit Services of America um, gets to, to, to serve. Um, so after I was in the graduate lab, um, I moved to a consulting firm, which helped me um, develop best practices for usability testing. And then I moved, well, before that, took a front end development course, um, opened my eyes to the fact that, okay, if I'm gonna design stuff, that design is actually going to be implemented somehow through code. If I'm not gonna code it, I need to tell someone how it needs to be coded and give them the understanding of why was it designed this way so that they understand who is it that we're trying to help by building whatever digital product it is. So went through that and I was very grateful to have that experience. Moved on to a consulting firm, uh, moved on to Qit, um, where I helped build some of their enterprise applications or at least design for them. Scooted over to their subsidiary Innate, where I got to learn all about construction. Um, I can put together an IKEA table with the best of them, but actually constructing things like a major infrastructure project uh, is really out of my wheelhouse. But I got to learn about how people do it and what's important to them. And now, again, I get to do the same thing for farmers and ranchers. I am struggling keeping a plant alive, um, but I get to help the farmers and ranchers that feed the world um, manage their finances and understand how to keep their business going. So these, these small or medium-sized business owners um, are helped through the stuff that we create every day, which is really meaningful. Um, and that's, that's where I find a lot of meaning within my job is knowing that it actually is going to do something that's going to, to change someone's life, whether or not they know it or appreciate it. Not here for the like, oh, Bianca, this is so great. This is life changing. Mm -hmm. That's, that's not why we do what we do. It's, it's to put it out there and to help them with something that they really need to do. So that's enough about me. But um, what is UX? I talked all about how I got to here. So my personal definition, the, the kind of foundational definition of UX is a combination of understanding the who, what, where, when, why, and how of a software product, application, or website. You could also do this for service design. So if you are running a business and you want to understand um, how to um, serve people in the best way within a hospital, doesn't necessarily mean it has to be a digital product, but that's more service design. But UX practices can come into that as well. But for right now, I'm going to focus mainly on digital products. Um, combines design and psychology to figure out how best to design a site or an app um, so that people can accomplish their goals. That is the foundation. That's where I start mo all of the time is who am I building it for and what are they trying to do? So I can tell you basic, at a very baseline level what it is. Um, it's much easier for me to tell you what UX is not and that's a time waster. UX is very important whether you have come to realize it yet or not. So why I love UX, if you couldn't surmise from my exuberance and just how generally jazzed I am about UX, right? Um, it's the combination of um, creativity and problem solving. UX is creative problem solving. You have this unique problem that you need to solve through creative means. So that doesn't necessarily mean art when I say creativity. It means um, I have a unique problem that doesn't have a defined answer. It can have many answers. Um, and we just need to work towards which one is going to be the best one for the folks who are going to use whatever digital product that is. Um, so the value of UX, you're thinking like, OK, I know you're really psyched about it, but why? Why should I care? Well. Bad UX costs organizations. So it costs money. If you yourself are a developer or you are a BA on a team who have uh, interacted with developers or written stories in order, for, um, in order to accommodate rework, you know um, the, the, the terrible value um, that a lack of UX brings. 
right? You, you, are, you are already working at a loss if you don't have UX. Um, the, good, the good value of UX, right? If you are able to have um, someone who is well-versed in UX on your team, um, they can bring, um, if we're looking strictly monetarily, right? Um, bring a lot of ROI to your particular product or your business. Um, but for example, Walmart redesigned their e-commerce site and had a 214% increase in visitors. So I'm going to assume, I don't know all of their numbers, but if you have more visitors, I'm like, I'm, I'm confident that more visitors probably means more conversion. Not necessarily, but it's likely. Bank of America changed their online banking registration um, and they increased their banking registration by 45%. So if more people are signing up for it, something had to happen where they're like, oh yes, I will use this, right? And so getting them into Bank of America system, they're able to offer them more products, keep them longer as a loyal customer. IBM um, has a report on UCD or user-centered design um, saying that every dollar invested in ease of use returns 10 to $100. So for every $1, that you invest in UX, some, some facet of UX, your return is 10 times that to 100 times that. I don't do much investing in my spare time, but if this was an investment that was available to me, it feels like a pretty good return, right? Mm -hmm. If you're guaranteed that something will multiply by 10 or $100, or, or 10 times rather, for every dollar that you put in, that feels like a win-win. So I want to introduce the um, terms that you might be familiar with and some, some terms that might be a little unfamiliar. So how many of you are familiar with the term full stack developer? Good chunk. For a, for a women in tech uh, group, I'm not surprised how many people are familiar with it, right? It's, it's understanding front end, back end, and databases. But a full stack designer is usually what we think of when we think of UX, but that's not necessarily what it is. Um, I, you can see the lovely unicorn that I've put over here. That's usually what we think of when we think of full stack designers, the, the folks that do everything from the initial upfront research to the um, static designs of a website or an application to the actual interaction of how it will work and, and how um, the functionality will, will play out within the application. And then sometimes it even in, involves the front end code. So if you have ever um, put out a job rec or read a job requisition for someone in UX, it could be any or all of these. So within our community specifically, um, it feels like we're, we're pretty focused on people doing more than one thing. And that's okay. Um, but it's going to take longer to find those folks. Usually, you'll find people who are a little bit more specialized. So myself, I focus on research and testing. Um, this is not a plug for the sandwiches that are out there. Um, this is a plug for me telling you how I am involved with the um, design and um, coding process, right? So I think of my job like a club sandwich. My worldview is food-based, so bear with me. <laughs> so I think of the parts where I play in, like the bread of a club sandwich. So in this example, there's no bread in the middle. Let's pretend there's three layers of bread. So that top level is that initial user research, understanding who are we building this for? What is the problem that we're trying to solve? That's the million dollar question. What is the problem that we're trying to solve? And who are we trying to solve it for? What can I learn about the people that really need this solution and do they need this solution, right? Then the, the lettuce and the tomato and maybe some of the like whatever dressing if you're into mustard um, is probably the, the design piece, right? You, you go with maybe a, an iteration of a design and then you show it to the team. And depending on what level of fidelity it is, we'll do different types of testing, whether it's formative testing of I think this is going to solve the problem, but let's ask some of the users. It's maybe a little bit less structured um, to summative testing, which is I know that this is the feature that we want to provide our users. How long does it take them to do it? 
are they able to accomplish this goal? So it's it is very structured and you're looking for specific things within that testing. So that's that that second level of bread is where I come in testing the particular designs, especially if, if I don't design them myself. That next level is I'm going to take all of that delicious feedback that I get from my users with whom I've tested and I'm going to iterate on that design or my teammates are going to iterate on that design. And then we go through the, the meat and maybe the cheese of iterating on the design. And then that bottom is that final testing, most likely summative of are they able to accomplish the goal that we know that they need to achieve with this particular product. You can have a, a, a highly decked sandwich of just toppings and bread and toppings and bread and meat and cheese and whatever. But um, the, the simple food analogy that I can make to my job is, is that club sandwich one. So when I said before, um, it's the who, what, where, when, why, how of building a particular digital product. These are the questions at a very high level that you want to try to ask. So who are we designing for? Who is going to use our product? Who is the person for whom we are trying to help um, and, and, and change their process, perhaps? Um, or not necessarily change their product or process, rather, but who are we trying to um, help um, su supplement their process or support their process? What is the user trying to accomplish? What are their goals? What functionality are we going to offer? So of all of the things that we want this, let's say, application to do, what are the things that we're going to do first? And is that enough? Where is our user accomplishing their goals? In what context are they working? Are they in, so in Qit, it was probably a job trailer. Here, it's probably a farm. Um, I've also worked with users who work out of their home. Um, or users who work out of their car. It's where are they trying to accomplish their goals? When are they most delighted? When do they reach each stage of their experience? So mapping it out, understanding um, what happens in that entire process for them and where are the areas of opportunity that we can build and help fix for them. Why does a particular design work? And how can we make it better? So that's, that speaks to some of the testing that I was talking about before. So the who. Who are we designing for and who is going to use our product? So there's a couple different things that you can do in order to figure this out. Um, you know, if you're starting from scratch, um, you can do market research. But if you know um, a little bit about what you want to provide and you understand who your user would be, um, you can do empathy mapping and personas. So understanding what is the problem that your users have um, and how can you segment them so you can understand are we solving the right thing for the right person so if i have a farmer who grows crops their challenges are probably different than a rancher but when it comes to um, running a business they probably have some some similarities but when it comes to the actual work that they do every day, it's probably a little bit different. So perhaps I would want to segment my users by farmers and ranchers if I'm talking about what I do right now. Right? So I might have a persona that's um, Fanny the farmer and Ricky the rancher. Um, not necessarily that cute, but um, I would want to create this shared understanding, not only with my UX team, but with the product team that I'm working on, so that we all have this shared mental model of who are we solving this problem for, because it's not me. A lot of times we get into it where it's like, oh, well, this is how I think it should work, and this is what I think we should do, and I know that this is, this is the way that we should go, but I am not the user, and I don't know best for my user. Unless I do this research, in which case I can understand how can I help them and, and what is it they really need to accomplish. The what. So what is the user trying to accomplish and what functionality are we going to offer? So if you think about different apps that you've used in your life where functionality has grown over time, they've made a conscious decision to say, I'm going to offer this. And then we're going to wait a couple of releases and then we're going to offer this. So if you take a look at some things that you are, 
probably very familiar with. So who's used Airbnb before? Yeah, quite a few. So it used to just be, I need a place to stay and I'm away from my home. But now they offer professional photography if you're a host. They offer different insurance plans. They offer home cleaning, a place for you to manage um, how people get in and out of your home or your residence that you're, you're um, loaning to them for a, a brief period of time. Um, but that was a conscious decision to say, we're gonna start just by um, low cost housing options for people, temporary housing. Um, same thing with Slack. How many of you have used Slack before? I hate to say it, but the Giphy integration was not there in the beginning. <laughs> but it's, it's great that it's evolved over time, right? It was originally just supposed to be that initial email killer of, I need a way to communicate with my team, and email is not working. So I need some sort of some chat option for my team. But it has grown, and it now uh, supports a full CRM. It has easy integrations. Um, you can do amazing, fantastic things with your um, channel integrations where you can pull in your Google Analytics um, to understand if your digital product is, is doing um, really well or needs an update if you're focused on analytics. So that's more of a product management tool, um, but it's still really valuable because if you know through some of the research that you've done that certain features are make or break, that people won't use it, then you can bring that to your team and say, listen, I know that people aren't going to be able to accomplish their main goals if we don't offer this functionality, right? So it's not necessarily a total UX tool, but it's a greater product management tool um, that, that's really beneficial, is setting that MVP. The where, where is our user accomplishing their goals? Is it in their home? Is it in a job trailer? Is it on a farm? One, one way um, that is really special is to actually go to a person's place of work um, or the place where they would be accomplishing their goals um, is to do what's called ethnography and actually watch them work. So if I were to explain to you, or if I were to ask you rather, um, explain to me how you make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Who, who would like to explain how they make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? I don't bite, I promise. <laughs> yeah, Colleen. Um, I've actually thought about this before because my husband makes it different than I do. Okay. I put the, you know, take the bread, two yep. pieces, put the peanut butter down, Okay. put the jelly over that, Okay. put the other piece on top, and then cut it. Okay. So it feels, feels fairly simple, yeah. right? Two pieces of bread, peanut butter first, jelly second. Do you cut diagonally, half? Depends on my mood. Okay, so that might, <laughs> so. So Colleen explained how she makes a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, but that doesn't give me a clear picture of if I wanted to help Colleen, if for some reason Colleen needed a, a, a better way to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, right? That's the way my husband did. Right, yes, yes. <laughs> so if, if we wanted to improve Colleen's process, I don't know if she uses a plate, I don't know if she uses a, a napkin instead, or she puts it on a paper towel. Um, I don't know where she keeps her plates, if she does use a plate. I don't know where she keeps her silverware um, for when she wants to cut the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I don't know if there needs to be something within her kitchen that we need to improve the, the um, approve upon for her process. Um, I don't know what flavor jelly it is. Um, there, there are certain things that I can't infer from her description because I don't know what Colleen's surroundings are like within her home when she's eating a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. But if I were to go to Colleen's house, I would understand that and I would watch and say, okay, um, she has to go all the way across the room because her plates are not on the same side of the kitchen as her silverware, right? I'm, I'm sure you have a lovely home and I'm sure you don't have any of these process <laughs> problems. But, but if I were to, to be helping improve upon this process, I would need to know certain things about the environment in which Colleen's working. So, this is very important if you're working in a specific context. So if it's someone who has a lot of distractions in their job, making sure that you provide a save button or a way to, to go back to their work, right? Um, or if they are totally mobile and they are traveling for a lot of their jobs, if you're going to make a web application, it needs to be mobile friendly. 
And some of these things you don't necessarily know right off of the bat because um, we rely on self-disclosure and self-reporting for like, oh yeah, people will just tell us what they do. We are so comfortable with our process that it's tough for us to explain exactly what we do. Like Colleen would have been here for maybe five or six minutes explaining like, I have this shade of cabinetry in my home and this is where I keep all of my plates. And sometimes I don't use a plate, but then I use a paper towel and then this is where the paper towels are. So, so I'm sure for this exercise, like we, we wanna shorten it down, but the more information that you can get when it's, it's some of those niche situations, it's going to be better. So you have a fuller picture of who your user is. The when, when are they most delighted? When do they reach each stage of their experience? So one of the things that we would do in order to understand the whole process that someone would go through. So um, think of your banking app. If you wanted to um, make a mobile deposit on your banking app, what does that process look like, right? In this instance, I have someone visiting a museum. So um, they've decided I'm going to visit that museum and I'm going to get in the car and maybe traffic is bad and then, oh my gosh, I have to park and this is just such a bummer. Maybe it's because they have to pay for parking and they weren't anticipating it. Maybe there aren't enough spaces, um, but this is some, this is a low point for them. And then they go to the entrance and they're maybe a little bit more neutral. And then they realize they have ice cream at this cafe. This is great. And then they realize, oh, I have to pay for tickets. And this is either I have to pay for tickets and it's the cost of the tickets or the ticketing system is slow or there's a really long line, but something here is making them upset. And then they go through the museum and they see all the lovely artwork and um, all of the different exhibits are there and they have varying levels of, of enjoyment and happiness and, and satisfaction. Um, and then they leave and they go about their business. Um, but this is important to see where are the places, where's the low hanging fruit? What are the things that we can, if we can't make it as, as, as lovable as ice cream, where can we bring some of those things from sad face to at least neutral, right? So that's the low hanging fruit of, of how do we at least lift it to a point where they're like, nah, that wasn't great, but it wasn't awful, right? There's no tears. The why and the how. So why does a particular design work and how can we make it better? This is where usability testing comes in. I have, um, this is a video um, that um, Google has put together. It's about three and a half minutes. Um, I don't know that I'm gonna show it right now because my computer has decided that it doesn't wanna play ball. Um, I maybe will try it and see if that, if it works. But this is a, a great primer to what usability testing is. Hi, I'm outside a cafe at the Google office in Mountain View, California, and we're about to see how Gorilla Usability Testing with as few as five users can help you find up to 85% of the core usability problems in your app. If I continue to play this, can you hear it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Come on, let's go take a look. Thank you for stopping by. I'm working with a client on a mobile application, and in a minute I'll show you the application and I'll ask you some questions about it. It'll take about 10 minutes. As you go through the application, I want you to think aloud, to voice whatever you're thinking or feeling as you look through it. Please be honest, this is a test of the application, not of you. All right. Time out. Guerrilla usability testing is a lot of fun, and it's one of the most effective tools you have to improve the quality of your app or website. In fact, it doesn't matter if it's an app, a website, a remote control, or a door. Usability simply means that people can use the thing for its intended purpose. And here's one fun and simple way to conduct guerrilla usability testing. Go to a fairly popular cafe, ask people to test your app for 10 minutes, and then give them a small treat as a thanks. It's a great way to spend an hour. Okay, time in. The great news is that you only need to talk to five users to find 85% of the core usability problems. Your most important usability problems are easy to spot for people who are new to your application and difficult for you to spot because you no longer have fresh eyes. You are too close to the product to know how real people perceive it for the first time. Jacob Nielsen is a usability testing pioneer who led extensive research to arrive at the magic five users number. 
It turns out that you learn a lot from the first person you talk to, a little less from the next, and so forth. After the fifth user, you're wasting your time by observing the same findings repeatedly, but not learning much new. You can use our ready-made template to customize your survey and print out a sign for the cafe. Next, decide who will go. One or two people is the perfect number. You don't want to have more than three people because it may make your tester feel uncomfortable. Everyone involved in your product should go at some point. This includes your designer, developer, product manager, executive, customer service people, etc. You'll want to choose a nice reward to give to your testers, like a gift card to the cafe or buy them a drink or dessert. People who are alone are easy to ask. And remember, after five people, you're done. The think aloud method is critical for getting inside a user's head. It means asking the user to speak out loud everything they are thinking. For example, they should be saying things like, hmm, this looks like a news app. I wonder how I can get it to show me the sports news. Maybe if I tap here, that's where I think it might let me select the category. Oh, that loaded pretty slowly, etc. Be sure to take good notes of what people say. Some clear patterns will emerge from the feedback you get. Back home, you can fix these usability problems, and what's critical is that you then come back to the cafe to validate that users no longer face these issues. All right, well, I think we're done. So now that we're finished, do you have any questions for me? No, I, th I thought it was uh, interesting. I hope the feedback is helpful. Thank you so much. And now it's your turn. You now have a new tool in your belt to make your app even more awesome. Go on and try this out in the real world. You can customize our template and questionnaire to suit your app. I'm Boris Macis with the Google Developer Relations team. Thanks for watching. So you don't have to be an official UX designer to go and get feedback on the product or service that you're trying to build or improve, right? Just asking for, for people to look at your product. Um, you want them to be the user, or at least within the category of user that you're looking for. Um, but showing it to someone is the best way to get feedback. So in my particular situation um, here at FCS America, I would need to, to test with the teammates that I work with if we're building internal tools, or I would need to talk to um, the farmers and ranchers who are our customers, right? So my, my pool is a little bit smaller, but if I'm building a news app, I could go into a cafe and just offer someone a bagel or a, a croissant or a Danish or something and say, hey, I would, I'd love to give you a muffin if you, you know, tell me a, a little bit about what you think about this app and just give me some feedback, right? It doesn't have to be super formal if you're just looking to, to better what it is that you're doing. So always get feedback. So I've been talking for long enough, but this, these are my particular thoughts when it comes to UX and the, the benefit of testing and the necessity for testing and for research and for design and for stepping away for, from your product to say, like, just like Bora said in the video, um, you need to step away and you need to look at it with fresh eyes and the best way to do that is through someone else to, to view your product. So you will never be your user, even if the, even if it's a news app that you might use, you are not the only user, right? You might have good insight because perhaps you share some of the same problems and you want to achieve some of the same goals, but you're too embedded in what you're building. And that's where I see a lot of problems with some product teams is they say, I know what's best. I know what's the best way to do this because I've been doing this for a very long time or I just know through prior experience, and then they go with it, and then they're missing a critical piece. And it, it's, you know, it's not because they're bad at their job, it's, it's the opposite, it's because they're very good at their job, and they, they don't have the ability to look at what they're building with fresh eyes, right? They're, they're too embedded in, in helping the people that they wanna help. But taking a step back, getting some feedback, getting some, some solid understanding of who your user is, is what you really need to do. Um, their motivations are geared towards accomplishing a task or completing a goal, even though you're trying to help them, right? You know too much by being on the product team to be an unbiased source. Keep listening to your users. This is where the true value of UX lies. So if you want to learn more on your own, 
These books by Steve Krug were um, some of the initial eye-opening um, books that I read to say, you get to do this as a job, this is so great. Um, so Don't Make Me Think goes over um, some usability principles and trying to understand if I am gonna design with my user and the problem I'm trying to solve in mind, um, what are some best ways to do that? Rocket Surgery Made Easy um, is a great guide for doing usability testing yourself. Um, he has a lot of great resources where if you want to try to do it yourself um, and try to, to work your UX muscle, um, you can build that strength um, through, through doing some, some UX on your own with, with some of his guides. Um. <laughs> So always test it, always test it, always get feedback, always want to be learning more. And that's what's going to benefit you most with UX. And thank you.